Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nasia, I'm the Membership Manager at London Funders and welcome to this festival, which is a part of our, sorry, this session, which is a part of our Festival of Learning 2024. We're really excited to have you here um, and we're really excited to hear from the Pilgrim Trust this afternoon. So the festival is an opportunity for London Funders members to come together to share learning and ideas and to be inspired by others in the funding community and civil society. This year, we've got a really packed programme with the sessions categorised under five core themes, participation, process, equity, collaboration and systemic change. So we hope to see you at other sessions during the festival as well. Um, the festival ends this week on Thursday, but there's still time to sign up to um, other sessions if you haven't already, including our festival finale, which is taking place on Thursday afternoon. So definitely have a look at that if you are able to attend. London Funders will be tweeting live from at London Funders with the hashtag, hashtag Festival of Learning 24. Um, so we do encourage you all to get involved on Twitter and on LinkedIn to share what you are learning from today's session, and other sessions that you are joining. Just for your information, we are also recording the session so that we can capture the lessons emerging from today. If there is something that is shared by yourselves during this session that you wouldn't want to be broadcasted, please let us know um, so that we can remove that kind of from our roundups. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're encouraging all of you to get involved online on social media as well. If you are able to turn on your camera, please absolutely turn on your camera. But of course we understand that life happens. So if you prefer to remain off camera, that is also fine. Um, but yes, that's all from me. If you need any assistance of any kind, you're welcome to drop either myself or my colleague, Aura, who is also on the call, um, a message, and then we shall action accordingly. But without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and I'll hand over to Sonia at the Pilgrim Trust. Thanks, Nancy. So my name is Sonia from the Pilgrim Trust. I am the grant manager for our social change program, and I will be joined today uh, with by Kadra Abdenasir, who is from Centre for Mental Health, our evaluators for the program, alongside Helen Gattenby from M13 Youth Project, who is a current grantee and a member of our first cohort of grantees. We also have with us today our chief exec, Sue Bowers, as well as my colleague, Justine, who will be um, assisting us with today. So first of all, just thank you very much for your time today and your interest in the work that we're doing and we're really, really glad to be able to share with you what we're learning so far. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen now. Got some slides for you here. Okay, so just let me know, can you see everything okay? Perfect, brilliant. Okay, so as I said, we are the Pilgrim Trust and a little bit about us. We were established in 1930 to support the urgent and future needs of the UK. And we give around three million pounds in grants um, a year to charitable causes. We have two main grant programs. Our first is our preservation and conservation program and that focuses mainly on preserving buildings of historic significance, um, historic objects and collections across the UK. Our other program is our social change program, which as I mentioned is the one that I manage. And um, it's funded a number of dis uh, different um, themes throughout the years, but the Pilgrim Trust has a long history of supporting women and girls. We, for a long time, were working with them in the criminal justice system. And then we made the decision to move further upstream into early prevention initiatives to support women and girls experiencing multiple disadvantage to hopefully stop them entering the criminal justice system in the first place. And then in 2021, after a strategic review, we decided to focus specifically on young women's mental health. Um, and so that's when the Young Women in Mind program was set up, uh, previously known then as the Young Women's Mental Health Fund. So why mental health and why young women? Well, young women have emerged as the highest risk group for mental ill health of all groups, male, female, young and old. Um, recent years in particular have seen a really sharp rise in mental ill health among young women. And you can see some of the statistics here today. 25% of young women have self-harmed 
or have experiences of depression and anxiety, which is twice the rate of our young men of similar age. Um, of all young people, 75% of mental health illnesses tend to develop before the age of 24. And 16 to 25 years is a period of huge change in young people's lives, which is why for this program, we focus specifically on young women between the ages of 16 to 25. It's a time when they're entering into adulthood, adulthood sorry, and their relationships are changing. They're perhaps entering into work for the first time or higher education. They may be becoming mothers and all sorts of um, critical things happening in that age range. It's also the time when young people who are already experiencing mental health difficulties and are being supported by CAMS, at the age of 18 or so, they have to then transition into adult mental health services, which are very complex and hard to navigate. And they have to often start over um, with, with learning about the adult social care service. And it's often described as a cliff edge of support where we lose a lot of our young people that we've worked really hard to engage with. So through this program of supporting between 16 to 25, we hope to ease that transition um, from children's mental health services to adult mental health services through hopefully having them have a consistent trusted relationship with a grantee that we're funding. This um, statistic was pulled from the NHS digital data release in 2023. And it shows quite clearly the picture of mental health among young people. So you can see that in the eight to 10 year range, boys um, experience a higher likelihood of mental health disorders than young women. Around 11 to 16 years, they're about the same. But then interestingly, between 17 to 25 years, young women um, by far exceed the rate of young men doubling, sometimes almost three times the amount. So that for us was kind of what data like this piqued our interest into, okay, what is actually happening with our young women? Why, why are they in such acute crisis? So we designed our fund, which distributes a million pounds um, a year to frontline service providers to work toward our theory of change, which is to increase the availability and the quality of mental health services available to young women across the UK. Um, and we developed what we call our four pillars of um, best practice around young women's mental health support. And we feel that those key elements are that the support is gendered, that it is age appropriate, that it is an integrated service, and that it supports equality. And what we mean by each of those, so when we speak about something taking a gendered approach, we don't simply mean that the service is solely available to young women. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. We are we look to support organizations that can demonstrate that they truly understand the context of young women's lives and the challenges that they're facing and the unique perspective that they have and therefore the tailored approach required to address their unique needs. We know, for example, that young women often experience higher rates of being the main carers or young carers for their family. They are more likely to be single mothers. They're more likely to experience physical or sexual violence than their male counterparts. We still, in many aspects, exist in a patriarchal society. There are cultural aspects as well that um, can lead to oppression of young women. Um, they when we spoke extensively with young women when we were developing the program, we were still hearing things like young women feeling dismissed by their GP and being called hormonal when trying to discuss their mental health challenges. Um, young women and women have particular mental health concerns around things such as miscarriage or postnatal depression or postnatal anxiety. Young women struggle with things such as um, unhealthy sexual expectations from their male um, or in any relationship that they're experiencing probably due to the overconsumption of pornography. That's you know another bit of feedback that we're hearing. So we ask organizations to tell us about the experience of their young women and then how they're designing their services to help young women understand the relationship between the context of their experiences and how that then goes on to impact their mental health and then how they can, of course, support them with their um, journey towards better mental health and managing their conditions. When we speak about an 
a project or you know service being age appropriate um you know it, it sounds really obvious when you say that the way that you're going to approach a young person is obviously going to be quite different from the way that you're going to approach um an older person um and it's we just ask that that be reflected in the way that an organization is working so challenges that young young women have spoken about is being distrust distrustful of statutory mental health services, perhaps because of negative experiences in the past with them, of services being quite rigid and then being discharged from services if perhaps they have missed appointments and not being able to re-engage without, ha without having to start the process again from scratch. They lack choice and autonomy, autonomy in the way that they um, receive the care that they need. And they often also comment that the environments are quite clinical and not young person friendly and that they're seeing lots of different people and so can't really develop relationships with trusted adult adults. So we asked organizations when developing their projects to think about those challenges and then think about how they can support young people, whether that be through flexibility of the offering in different times or through, you know, Zoom as well as in person how they can make the space feel safe for young people and engage in the site and if they're delivering activities to make sure that they're really um, young people specific and just something that would lead to lead into their interests as well. And when we speak of uh, a service being integrated, what we mean is just the recognition that mental health difficulties rarely exist in isolation. And so we, we prioritize supporting organizations that had either good referral pathways to other services, or we're delivering holistic packages of support for young women um, themselves so that if a young woman is presenting with mental health difficulties, but is suffering with homelessness or domestic abuse, that they can receive help for all those different aspects um, and not just one thing. And of course, in terms of equality, we what we mean by that is that a young woman, no young woman has to work harder to access the mental health support they need than any other young woman. And so things like sexuality and race are taken into account, neurodiversity, and again, how to support young women in those intersecting needs. Our current locations are right now working in Northern Ireland, the Northwest and Northeast of England and Yorkshire and Humble. And we award, as I said, I think, grants of up to £100,000 over three years. We, the Pilgrim Trust, are a UK-wide fondo. We have chosen to start in these particular areas right now. Um, in year one, it was just funding for Greater Manchester and Northern Ireland, but we um, have slowly been expanding that. And of course, this is speaking here and an opportunity we hope to be able to further expand into London where of course a lot of our young women are struggling and there's desperate need for this kind of targeted mental health support for young women. In terms of what we're looking for for funding our organizations we were looking to support organizations developing that high quality service specifically designed to respond to the needs of young women with mental health difficulties and particularly those who had entrenched mental health needs. We This is not an early intervention or preventative service. It's for those young women who have already fallen through those gaps and who without assistance would develop far more significant uh, mental ill health. Again, about providing regular ongoing support to young women, which is why we fund for at least three years so that organizations are able to um, support young women through the length of their recovery and that young women have the option to come in and out of services as necessary. And also super important to us was leading organizations that were demonstrating good practice or innovation around gender and age informed approaches to mental health provision. We have eight fund principles that um, we use to prioritize organizations that we funded. And uh, sorry, I'm just checking my time here. So if organizations that had a track record of working with young women, however, we we felt it's really important to support young women, young women wherever they are already receiving support and wherever they already feel is a safe space. So by no means were the organizations that we fund specifically just mental health services. We have funded youth organizations, domestic abuse services, mental health services, and a whole range of other um, services within different sectors. It's also really important that services are trauma informed because of the fact that young women are more likely to have experienced trauma, whether that be um, sexual or physical violence, but also just adverse childhood experiences 
tend to be traumatic and organizations, we ask them to apply that trauma support so that young women are getting the kind of service they need. And a few others here, we spoke about the, the wraparound service. Um, safe women only spaces was obviously really important so that they are able to speak about things in a way that they perhaps aren't able to speak up, feel comfortable speaking about in the presence of of males and especially in the context of abuse, you can you can see you know why that's important. It was really also important to us that the voice of young women um, was taken into account and that services were designed with them. Um, they are always going to be the experts in their lives and they know best about what it is that they need. So we asked organizations to think very carefully about how they would incorporate um, feedback from their young women and how they would then implement that into their services. Um, and that's the organizations were representative of the groups that they were trying to support. And the organizations demonstrated um, that innovation and that willingness to share their learning with others and that their work, they, they look to make a greater impact than the beneficiaries that they're supporting. All of our grantees become part of a cohort. And this is a new way of working for the Pilgrim Trust, but it's been hugely valuable for us. Um, the funding world as it stands tends to create competition among charities. Effectively, we we're all asking organizations to tell us why they're best placed to deliver the work that they're doing. And so that can kind of create an environment of them feeling pitted against each other. Um, but in the cohorts that were created because all already had the funding and were working toward the same goal, it was a, a non-competitive environment, which really led to open communication and strong collaboration. And just a, a couple of quick examples um, of that is because there's such a wealth of knowledge among the cohorts, because they're, they're working in lots of different sectors, um, that sharing led to strengthening of their projects, whether it be, for example, mental health specialist organizations learning from youth, youth work organizations about how best to reach and engage their young people and youth organizations in turn learning about um, specialist mental health techniques that they could use with their young people or, um, you know, BAME organizations being able to give that, those cultural insights of, into how organizations could make themselves more accessible to the BAME community. Um, and for us as well, it's been hugely valuable because it's identified um, emerging trends uh, among behaviors of young women or the challenges within the, the sector and you know where we as a Pilgrim Trust could perhaps concentrate our efforts in terms of influencing policy at a regional and national level. And it also helped us to develop um, a stronger relationship with our grantees um, by us being able to demonstrate our own flexibility. A lot of these organizations that we supported, this was their first um, venture into specialized support for young women. And it's obviously been a learning curve for all of us, but us, we've really tried to demonstrate that we're very interested in the learning. We're very interested in what's not working as much as what is working. And I think that's also led to a lot of trust between ourselves and our cohorts. Now, very quickly into the evaluation, Katra is going to speak more about that, but we partnered with Centre for Mental Health at the beginning of this the project because we wanted to be able to ensure that we were capturing the right data from the outset. Um, and the evaluation framework was developed in consultation with the first cohort of grantees using qualitative and quantitative um, data, again, incorporating the direct voices of our young women, um, which was really important to us. And lots of insights uh, is already emerging, which I will pass over to Kadra to tell us more about. Thanks, Sonia. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Sonia, can you guys see that? Yeah, perfect. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kadra Abdinasa. I'm the Associate Director for Policy at Centre for Mental Health. Um, just really briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, we're an independent mental health charity with a specific focus on bridging the gaps between policy research and practice. Um, and our strategic area of focus really is on tackling mental health inequalities, so tackling gender inequalities within that is a key um, priority for us. Um, 
And we also host um, a network that's relevant to this area, the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition, um, which really brings together about 300 plus organizations to campaign for better mental health provision for babies, children and young people. Um, so as Sonia mentioned, I'm just going to briefly talk through some of the emerging learnings um, from this program. So in terms of our evaluation, so um, we created a framework in partnership with the projects um, that aligned to the program's overall theory of change. Um, and essentially there's a mix of quantitative and qualitative insights that our research team led on gathering. Um, so we the, the findings I'll talk through will draw on project level reporting, surveys with young women, focus groups and interviews with both young women and project leads and practitioners. Um, before I delve into the findings, I just wanted to set the context a little bit by outlining the range of complexities, and Sonia alluded to some of this, in young women's lives and uh, the breadth of needs that the projects really have been responding to. And because of this, we've had to like adapt and be really flexible and thoughtful in how we gather data to um, inform the evaluation. So um, I'm sure none of this is a surprise to yourselves, but you know, really recognizing the impact of things like the cost of living crisis, stigma, um, and again, how there might be in some ways a double stigma for girls and young women who are experiencing mental health problems, but also um, coping with other forms of discrimination and abuse in their lives. Um, many of the young women also have multiple needs and comorbidities, so thinking about mental health problems and, and being autistic or having learning disabilities. Um, and as Sonia said as well, many of them have caring responsibilities, other concerns as well, such as like substance use and unsettled immigration status, which can be keep young women in a state of anxiety um, in many ways. So in terms of year one, um, we were successfully able to engage around um, 788 young women um, through the evaluation. Actually, sorry, 788 young women were engaged through the activities um, in the program with cohort one. Um, and our analysis so far um, points to preliminary evidence that um, taking an age and gender specific approach to mental health provision can be quite effective. So um, ov overall, young women reported increased levels of confidence and self-esteem, increased understanding and awareness of mental health concerns. Um, many of them through the projects were able to develop positive coping strategies and mechanisms and also um, expand their network of support around themselves. Um, overall, this resulted in young women reporting um, higher levels of well-being in the and daily life satisfaction. So just digging into some of the sort of seven key themes that came out of year one. Um, so something that was quite important that many of the youth workers we spoke to reported was the importance of having that depth of understanding of uh, the experiences young women faced. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, really recognizing those intersecting needs and experiences they have and being able to support that and um, provide that wraparound support or signposting to other services was quite critical. Um, again, I know trauma-informed approaches seems to be a bit of a buzzword in our sector, but if um, for any other cohort than this one, it's crucial that um, practitioners working with young women take that trauma-informed approach, that they are tailored in the services and interventions they offer. They're responsive, um, they exercise professional curiosity. So trying to seek to understand young women's past experiences um, and recognizing how relevant that is to the issues that they are presenting with today. Um, another key finding was young women really having that safe and exclusive sp um, space. Um, so we're talking about all women, young women spaces here so that they feel seen and heard um, and valued and are able to open up about the issues that they're facing in their lives. Um, many of the young women also reported that having that immediate um, support was really critical for them. Um, we know that, I think I was looking at some stats earlier that I think it showed about 18 months on average in 2023 that young people face in terms of getting an assessment for mental health services. So really um, huge long waiting times and high thresholds for mental health support services in the first place. So um, this was just a golden opportunity for many of them to access that immediate help that they needed um, and that the support was also flexible. So, you know, there wasn't sort of formal waiting lists or criteria that young women had to meet in comparison to traditional mental health services. 
Um, so that there's a quote here from one of the practitioners just um, highlighting the importance of this. Um, and then another thing many of the young women recognized as being hugely valuable for them was having a peer support network. Um, so they really talked about expanding their networks and connections with other young women from a diverse range of backgrounds through the diverse activities that the projects themselves offered and how this helped them to kind of relax a little bit and being able to kind of support them with um, help seeking for other concerns they might have in their lives. Um, so again, a young person here saying, having this program, the support from the girls to the workers, it really made me realize that not everyone walks out um, and some people in your life have your back. Uh, another thing the project leads um, noted was how it helped them and their projects also expand their network of support for taking that more gender and age specific approach. So really recognizing um, what services and pathways in their local community was available that could provide that comprehensive support and integrated support for girls and young women. So, you know, thinking about sectors such as financial advice and support, housing, employment, um, and overall that this allowed um, them to provide a more complete and holistic support for, for young women's mental health and well-being needs. Another um, key finding was that actually for many young women who had previously tried to reach out for support, they felt that the sort of one size fits all approach didn't really cater to their needs um, and was quite inflexible or limited in many ways. So the projects um, through this Pilgrim Trust program were able to offer more individual and tailored support, support that was quite key in engaging young people and ensuring that they had good outputs. Um, so again, an example here where a young woman from one of the projects compares it to the support that they receive in school. Unfortunately, that was quite negative. They didn't really feel heard um, until, unfortunately, their mental health needs escalated. So now I just wanted to talk really briefly on some opportunities and implications um, for the systems change and uh, policy change ambitions the programs also have. And these were a few that I just wanted to highlight. Um, firstly, for broader civil society. So thinking about things that you yourselves and others in your networks can take forward. I think firstly, the importance and the need to shift from awareness to action in young women's mental health. So I think for a good decade now, we've had consistent statistics telling us that young women's mental health is worse um, or is worsening. And I think currently like one in four young women report a mental health concern, but action to address this has really been slow. Um, so I think we're really keen to accelerate action with this and you know, thinking about ways of testing and developing and learning and scaling up solutions in this space. Again, through our evaluation, we hope to contribute to the evidence base around what works in this area. Um, it's really key also that we support advocacy in this space. So it is really difficult at the moment with political narratives to get young women's mental health on the agenda. Um, you know, recently we've heard of government ministers referring to mental health as going too far. Um, and again, whenever we try and bring up issues around equity, you know, it's unfortunately a victim of the culture wars conversations at the moment. So you can imagine trying to get this issue on the agenda can be tricky, but, um, you know, there's power in numbers and that's why we need many organizations advocating in this space. It's also key that we have adequate and long-term funding to protect young women's healths and futures. And really, although the Pilgrim's Trust program focuses on young women, we need to like upstream support. So making sure that we're supporting children at the very earliest stages, right the way through, you know, into adulthood and making sure that that funding and pathway of support is available. And lastly here, um, Another key finding, you know, that came out of the evaluation is just the importance of breaking down silos and taking that real holistic support. And we need to ensure as services, commissioners, funders, researchers in this space that we're not replicating those silos that have not served girls and young women for too long. And then from a sort of policy perspective, I just wanted to plug some work we've been doing at the center with our partners in the wider sector. Um, and so we produced a 10 year manifesto document last year called A Mentally Healthier Nation, which sets out a range of recommendations from prevention right the way through to crisis care. Um, and I'll pop a link in the chat if anyone's interested in reading more. 
but for girls and young women there were particular implications um from this that we are taking forward and using that to influence um in the lead up in, in the lead up to the general election so firstly there's a whole range of like policies um that national government can take action on to address gender disparities inequalities and injustices so thinking about things like pay equity childcare provision um justice and support so again you know how hugely unacceptable it is for victims of sexual violence to get justice in this country and the long waits they face or the really re-traumatizing um, pathways to justice that exist there. Those are things that national government can address. Thinking about ways of gender and trauma-informed approaches being embedded within mental health services, you know, thinking about the NHS itself, but also more broadly schools, colleges, employers, and other settings playing a role. Um, again, really amplifying and embedding the need to take an intersectional approach to young women's uh, experiences and mental health needs, um, expanding maternal mental health support. So we know in recent years there's been a stronger focus on this um, with the rollout of perinatal mental health services, but um, we did some work recently looking at the experiences of young mums across the UK, and unfortunately it's not looking great in terms of the uh, the the lack of like dedicated provision for them and they fall through the net between child and adult services and then lastly um, reforms to the mental health act which is something that's been promised for the last six years but hasn't yet been delivered and unfortunately we are seeing um, growing numbers of girls and young women being detained under the mental health act and really they shouldn't reach that crisis point if they had good quality community-based support available in the first place um, so I think that's it from me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Helen. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Helen Gatenby uh, from the M13 Youth Project in Manchester, and we are one of 10 projects that the Pilgrim Trust funded. We're now in our third year, so starting two years ago um we're in we're in greater manchester so uh i'm going to start in an odd place which is just to talk a little bit about construction because when i realized this it it gave me great joy so to hold a floor up and hold floorboards up you have joists which are hugely long strong pieces of wood that one run from one wall to another and if there is something wrong with that joist, it means when you step on the floorboards, everything is wobbly. And you need to find a way of fixing that joist. And apparently in construction, the way that you do that to fix the joist is you put two strong pieces of wood, really strong, alongside, you fix them to the joist, and then you do whatever it is you need to do to fix what's going on with the joist um, and the two pieces of wood at the side take the kind of load of the floor and the joist whilst that's happening. And then you take those away when the work has been done. That process is called sistering in construction. And when we discovered that, it was a great joy. I was sat in a room with a group of the young women that we were working with before even we'd, we'd heard about this project. And we, uh, as a result of that, devised a project in response to the Pilgrim Trust's call called the Sistering Project, because that's what we aim to do, is to stand alongside young women whilst they do the strengthening work that they can do for themselves and get uh, extra specialist help when they need it to make sure that the, the base of their lives is solid, that they've got solid place to move forward from. So how do we do that? So we are a specialist youth work project. Um, primarily we meet young people out on the street doing detached youth work. And then we invite young people to develop further work with us. And what we had seen over 15 years of work with young women is that as they, hit the ages of 14, 15, 16, 17, their mental health was increasingly deteriorating and getting worse. 
So at that point, um, we we thought we need to do more around supporting their mental health. We already had a gendered group, so a single sex group for young women. Um, and we talked to that group about whether they were open to having more of a focus on, on their mental health and more of an overt focus. And that led to an application to the Pilgrim Trust. Um, what that means for us in practice is we have carried on with a gendered space using youth work principles and practices. So we um, invite young women into it and they are very much in control of what happens in that space, supported by two qualified youth workers. And now through the Pilgrim Trust funding with access to a counsellor in the space so they can meet a counsellor uh, within their local community setting, or they can go out to a qualified counsellor that we will help support them to find. Um, what do we do in the space? We chat, we listen, we have fun, we laugh. Um, the group is aged, starts the youngest is 16, although sometimes we will um, accept a 15 year old into the space if they need that support. Often we get young women saying, can I bring my friend? I want my friend to come along and experience this space. And the girls organize it as they want to. How is it trauma informed? Well, a lot of work now between adults and young people is often conceived of managing young people's behaviour. And we see very negative um, stereotypes in social media, in the kind of mainstream media about young people's behaviour, about particular types of behaviour from particular types of young people. Youth workers look behind the behaviour to what's going on. They listen to what the behaviour is saying. They don't judge, they don't blame, they don't stigmatise. And this is what we do with young women. So they're stepping into a safe space where when they want to express their emotions and there may be anger or frustration at what has been happening to them in life, they can do that in a safe way with workers who really listen and don't judge or blame them for what they're doing but listen to what's going on behind that. So some of our work is really ordinary. Um, it has been supporting young women in school and with issues in school. Uh, everything that uh, Kadra and Sonia have said, for example, about school counselling, we've experienced, we've had young women say that they really struggle trusting counsellors in school because they've told something to a school counsellor but then two days later, a teacher has come back and spoken to them about. So confidence has been broken. So they don't have trust. Whereas what happens when they step into our setting is that we don't ask intrusive questions. And that's really important because if you do that too early, young people wonder why, particularly young women, question why you're not building trust, but also you risk re-traumatizing young people, young women especially, before they're ready to explain what has gone on in the past in a way that they can manage and at a pace that they can manage. So some of the activities we do are very ordinary. Recently we went pottery painting and it's really amazing how much conversation comes out around painting pots. We've done jewellery making. When you're busy with your hands making some jewellery, and thinking about how you feel about yourself and where you're gonna wear this jewelry and what's gonna happen. Loads of conversations come out. Sometimes we're in the great position of something happening. Well, not necessarily the great position, but sometimes a young woman will come in and go, I've got a story to tell you. And everyone stops what they're doing and gathers around and sits and listens to a story. And how amazing it is, a, lot, a couple of weeks ago, a young woman was harassed on the street by a particular organisation who were claiming to offer a youth group that supports her mental health. And she felt that she couldn't say no to somebody harassing her for her name and phone number. So she gave out her name and phone number. And she came to the group really concerned about this because she hadn't wanted to, but she didn't feel she could say no 
to this adult on the street. Um, and this is so often the case with many vulnerable young people and adults can abuse that vulnerability. As she was telling this story um, and, and going through what had happened, the whole of the rest of the group of young, young women sat and supported her and encouraged her. Two of them said, that's happened to me with that group as well. And so there was suddenly a sense of wonderful solidarity for her. She felt like she wasn't the only young woman who had been in her language stupid enough to fall prey to this group. Um, and she left feeling completely different about herself and about that experience. It feels something that's so small, but actually that wasn't then something that preyed on her mind for days and days and days. It didn't reinforce a narrative that she has had spoken to her about herself over days and, and months and years. So um, we start where young women are, we start with what they want to reveal, they can stay for as long as they want as part of the group. And quite often as they find that their mental health is improving, they are supporting other young women with their mental health, which is just a joy to watch. Um, I'm trying to think of anything. Yeah, the other thing is control. It's really important that we give young women control. And so um, we talk regularly about the activities that we do. That's why we do very ordinary activities alongside taking young women out of Greater Manchester to places which are hopefully going to regenerate and renew their spirit in nature, in the countryside, um, outdoors. We think about food and nutrition and look at all different kinds of elements as they come up that young people want to look at themselves. Um, for us, it's been really important to do this in a women-only space because men at times can take up all the available space and literally in youth clubs, sometimes women get pushed right to the edge. It's so different in terms of when women are can use all the space and how they choose to use it, both emotionally, psychologically, but also the physical space in a building. Um, which is what we do. So they have time to do things together, to go off on their own, to meet with us outside of the setting if they need to. So we have work mobiles, they can contact us when they need support. And we will accompany them to the doctors to say to the doctor, it isn't good enough that you just put, you know, have ignored this young woman's um, request for support. Or we will support them to school or college or, to, or support them around job interviews, CV writing, applications to university. The support we offer is holistic at the point that the young women need it. And that as well massively reduces the stress on their mental health because they know that they can come to somebody about anything, not just about clinical mental health needs, but about any needs they have and they're taken seriously, they're listened to, and they're helped. And they are helped for themselves to find their help, to build their own strong networks together and to make those bonds with other women that mean that they've got support, not only within the group, but outside the group. So I've spoken for 50 minutes, I think. I shall leave it there and very open to questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Helen. That was really really insightful um so just to wrap up from our side before we take questions very quickly obviously um you know the three of us and others in this space believe that discussions around mental health alongside service design and delivery frequently to fail to take into account gender uh, needs and yet we know that women and girls have distinct and specific needs and therefore policies and services and practice as well need to be gender informed. So we at Pilgrim Trust are working in the areas that we are currently, though, as I said, we are looking to expand and we're really keen to collaborate with other funders um, to bring much needed funding into this space um, and to work alongside you in terms of campaigns and advocacy to shine a light on this issue. I'll pop my email into the chat as well if you'd like to contact me directly, whether that be for collaboration opportunities, or even for us to share with others this approach so that they can take it forward in their own work. Well, thank you very much. Any questions? I 
think we had one from, first of all, thank you for such an insightful presentation. Um, and it was very, very comprehensive as well, which I'm shocked anyone was able to do in the time that you had. So thank you, Sonia, Helen and Kadra. Um, there is a question from Ewan from Minds that was dropped in the chat that said, just out of curiosity, have you funded work specifically for young tra trans women? Specifically for trans women, no, but we do include them in our work. So when we say um, young women and girls, we mean all young women and girls. We do leave it to each organization to decide on who they work with though, because there are certain um, circumstances, particularly around domestic abuse, where organizations have fed back that um, they may need a separate group for their trans girls, um, in which case that's fine because as long as that's done sensitively, but we do include all young women and girls. I think that is a great answer, Ewan. If you have any follow-up answers, please don't be afraid to drop them in the chat. Alternatively, if you do have a question and you don't want to put it in the chat, but you'd like to verbally share, you're welcome to use the hands up function um, and Or and I can have a look at the participants list to see who is keen to ask some more. Um, so we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to think um, and drop their messages or um, just raise their hands and we can pass over to you to ask. Uh, the team. Um, Aura has also put in the chat that uh, London Funders have just published a blog from the Pilgrim Trust today, touching some more on the topic discussed. So actually, if you'd like to follow up and read some more, um, you can do so on the uh, London Funders website. I can see that Kadra has also dropped the link to their a mentally healthier nation. So I was going to say London. It's the London funders in me, you see. But the nation matters as well, of course. Um, so if you want to read more about the work that they're doing over the next 10 years, you can also follow that link too. It does apply to London as well. Hooray. Um, that's reassuring to know. Um, but yes, if nobody has any other questions, or I have a question actually, um, Sonia and Sue and Justine over the Pilgrim Trust, you spoke a lot about kind of collaboration. Um, what would that look like for funders who wanted to get involved um, in the work that you are doing? And um, what, yeah, what would good collaboration look like for you? Yeah, so Sue, do you want to take that? Yes, I can take that. We would be really interested in, um, we have quite a good track record of collaboration with other funders, particularly on our um, other side of our work on preservation and conservation. It can take you know, different um, forms, but I think the demand of the programme is growing and we'd be really interested in um, you know, talking to other funders who are interested in the, the programme and working with us and partnering with us to um, roll it out and, and, and develop it. So that's what would be really good to, to do that. And also I think, aside from the funding, but also starting to take some of the findings from the evaluation and um, see how they might be applied for the funding that they may be given directly in terms of grants in the field of working with young people and perhaps thinking again, when they are advertising um, and running programmes, whether there could be a more Asian gender specific focus within their own programmes. So I think collaborations can take yeah, many different forms, but um, that's one of the things we'd be quite interested in, really happy to talk to people about. And also, as we, you know, as was said before, there's power in numbers in terms of shining a light on the issue. So we're also really interested in lending our voice um, or perhaps coordinating voices around um, policies specific to young women's mental health as well. And we'd be happy to collaborate on that sense too. Amazing. Thank you very much, Sue and Sonia. And I think we've got one more from um, Ewan as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm, I'm a question hog uh, in some of these sessions, but um, I th I'm just reflecting on sort of some of the... Uh, the, the, the kind of principles and standards, Sonia, that you, you kind of set out for the grants in the first place. And uh, uh, what I'm curious about is whether or not you've got um, 
built into that any kind of um, grants plus type offer. I'm specifically thinking about um, trauma informed, um, partly because we're just entered into doing a bit of work around kind of um, uh, kind of building a trauma informed vision for children, young people. Um, and we are working with a couple of um, local mines, uh, two in the Northwest and one in Yorkshire. And so I was just wondering if you're, you're kind of doing any work to support your grantees to improve their trauma-informed vision and practice. Sure. So we, we do ask a lot of questions at the time of application around an organization's existing trauma-informed practice and how that translates beyond policy to actual practice, because, you know, as Kadra said, it is kind of a buzzword. Um, so we've been fortunate in the sense that most of our cohort members already do have quite a strong understanding of that, but we are led quite heavily by um, what our cohorts feel that they need. And we have three cohorts running now and each has different needs because there's members from different sectors that can sometimes, for example, within the group, share those insights into what is really effective trauma-informed practice. But we've also worked with an organization called One Small Thing. I don't know if you've heard of them. And they are uh, trauma-informed. They deliver a lot of trauma-informed services, particularly in the context of females. So if um, a cohort member felt that that would be useful to them, then that's something that we can consider um, funding that course so that they can then further embed that into their work. And then there's always those really good examples from the cohort sharing every two months of how this actually works for them in practice and what like, good practice looks like. But one small thing, they're a fantastic organization and they do really good training on around that. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and also Kadra has kindly dropped in another link to the UK Trauma Council, who also produce a lot of resources, research and training. So hopefully that's also a good source um, of information for considering how to support organizations um, become better at trauma informed work. We've also got a question from Callan from the National Lottery Community Fund asking, do you get many projects supporting marginalised women and girls whose experiences might overlap with other parts of their identities? Absolutely. So um, we funded BAME specific organisations. We've uh, in our second cohort funded one that was um, looking at the link between neurodiversity and mental health difficulties for young women specifically and how um, that gets overlooked quite a lot. There's a lot of talk within the funding world and Pilgrim Trust was part of funding some research recently that highlighted uh, once again something I think we all know that uh, disabled women are being really underserved in all sectors and that includes the mental health sphere so that's something that this funding role will probably be looking at more closely in terms of how we can try to attract more organizations working in that space to support young women. But absolutely, it, we fully appreciate that there are lots of intersecting needs and they all contribute to, um, you know, poor mental health outcomes for young women. Absolutely. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself there. Thank you very much, Callan. I hope that has also answered your question. If there are no more questions from the floor, I just want to say thank you again. We have a comment in the chat that I think, yes, that is, um, it captures very well what this session was about. It was a very comprehensive presentation. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of whether or not the recording will be sent out, I'll just ask Aura to confirm whether or not that's something that we are doing at the moment or not at present. Aura is our learning and comms officer, so she's one of the amazing brains behind this year's festivals. Um, so I'll just wait for Aura to give that answer if she is here and able. Okay, we are hoping to upload the recording onto our YouTube, yes. And also we will be releasing the festival report, um, which we do every year. So some of you may have seen our previous festival reports 
Granted, I don't think it will be as lengthy as the previous years, because if you're familiar with London Funders, you know we do like a bit of a chunky report. So we're being mindful and trying to make things a little bit more um, streamlined and digestible. So keep your eye out for that as well. Once again, please don't forget to register for the other sessions that are still going on this week, including the festival finale happening on Thursday afternoon. And if you have any thoughts or feelings about anything that was shared today, or you'd like to follow up with London Funders or the Pilgrim Trust, or Kadra, or Helen, please get in touch and we can connect you all. But thank you very much, everyone. We hope you have a great afternoon and we look forward to seeing you at other festival sessions as well. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.